So we've gone from qubits to what do they call it? P-bits is what they're calling it. They're claiming it's a different thing. So it is, it is kind of like, yeah, it's a different engine, right? It's a different. It's not the same as a, a standard quantum computer because now we're going about this completely differently, right? Instead of creating our quantum flux, we're just measuring the existing quantum flux. That's how I look at it. The part where I disagree, I, I, this is definitely a quantum computer, right? Like the difference is that I think that from classical physics, we can explain Brownian motion. The question is, why do we have this Brownian motion? And is there a connection to the zero point energy? Even in Paul Thibodeau's presentation with Charles Chase, one of the questions he gets afterwards is, do you think there's a connection to the from the thermal energy to the zero point energy? And I would say yes. I would personally say yes. But that's where I am. And I don't feel the need to argue with people about this because it's more of a conceptual view of the world. As long as your microchip works, I don't really give a crap what you call it or how you claim that it, it functions. As long as it works, it works, man. So... The problems that they bring up, first of all, they did not like the quantum experience. They also talk about the noise is a problem. Now, the noise in this case is the quantum noise. So I think what they're talking about here is the difficulty it is to take a measurement. The thing about quantum systems is that if you try to measure them, they fall apart. So it seems like they found an indirect way to measure this thermal flux which reduces the noise. And the noise is something that's talked about a lot. Even John Kramer brought up the quantum noise when it came to quantum communication systems and quantum computers. He says that the noise, you have to reduce the noise to find the one photon that's entangled. You might have 100 photons that are not entangled and one photon that is entangled. How do you sift through the noise to find the entanglement? This is almost like a way around that where they're saying, you know what? We're not even going to look for that. We're just going to measure everything naturally. And then we're just going to see where it goes. So it's a different approach. And the problem they're trying to solve is the energy scaling problem. The energy scaling problem is as we make the microchips more and more advanced, they're going to require more and more energy. And as we make more and more data centers, we require this huge amount of energy. One way to solve that is to make fusion power, where we have unlimited energy. Another way to solve that is to reduce the energy requirement of the microchips themselves and of the computers themselves. Which of these options is better? I don't necessarily know. <laughs> I would say that both options, we should be going down both roads. We should be both increasing our output of energy and reducing uh, the amount of energy that we use. Both are great ideas. And so I, that's why another reason why I'm all in kind of, I don't want to say I'm all in, but I'm a, so far I'm pretty high on this company. Um, so they're approaching the problem from the efficiency standpoint, instead of approaching it from the standpoint of just producing more and more power. That sounds great. Here's my big question that well, maybe we can figure out while we watch this video is what does it do? Can, does this going to require, my understanding is, is this going to require people to move to new hardware, which is kind of a taboo thing. You generally don't want to say, hey, everybody, we built this new thing. It just doesn't work with any of your old hardware. You need to switch to a whole new, whole new hardware and potentially new software as well. If that's the case, I'm not as high on it. One of interoperability and integration with existing systems is really important. So this is the part where I just don't know enough about software and I'm not pretending to be an expert on quantum computers or anything like that, even though I, I talk about quantum physics a lot. So what I would want to know is really what is the practicality of building data centers that are using these and what do we need to do to have software that can use these and run real programs off these processors? Their approach was to say, let's look at the human brain. Let's assume the human brain is a quantum computer. How is the human brain using such a small amount of energy? This is, I, this is something I've even wondered about. People have asked me this on spaces and things like that. We should be looking at nature. If we want to know, hey, how do we reduce the energy requirement on our computers? Well, there's a computer right here in everybody's head. And the amount of energy that our bodies are using 
is extremely low. We are low entropy biological beings. We use an extremely small amount of energy to do what we would say is a straight up magical amount of computation. The amount of information that you are feeding through constantly is huge. So this was their basis for figuring out how do we lower the energy requirement? And I love this. I love it. One times more energy efficient. Um, and so, you know, the idea was, you know, if we engineered a computational system from first principles for AI, uh, inspired from biology, how do we take inspiration for biology? You don't try to mimic biology directly. You don't try to do biomimicry. You wouldn't build a plane that flaps its wings. You don't understand the principles that biology has learned to, to, uh, to harness. And um, essentially, you, you'd harness uh, those principles directly with an artificially engineered device. And so that's what we're doing was sort of a, a type of physics called stochastic thermodynamics. So this isn't like, like your great-grandfather's thermodynamics. It's, it's, really, it's a really recent theory. You know, the core theorems are like 1999. Uh, it's as old as Google. When math is as old as Google, you know it's really young. Uh, and that's why people don't really know about this type of physics and this type of math, and that's why it gets so out on Twitter. So you know what's also weird about this, guys? Is he says stochastic thermodynamics here. Is this connected to stochastic electrodynamics? Because supposedly, here's how this goes. And I'm, I'm let's say, fairly confident in this assessment. Uh, remember when I did the TR3B stream? Um, Jared Yates. I spoke to Jared Yates. Well, I think it was him. Maybe it was somebody else. But uh, it might have been the other guy, Douglas Miller. I can't remember who it was. Anyway, stochastic electrodynamics was basically a different branch. Instead of quantum electrodynamics, we go down this stochastic electrodynamics. Yes, there it is. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Jason, stochastic electrodynamics is just quantum electrodynamics plus the ether. That's a simple way to think about it. So when he starts bringing up stochastic electrodynamics here, this is when I got really interested as well. Because I'm sitting here going, I think these guys are just measuring the ether. I think this microchip is just measuring the ether and running computer off of it. And if you were to ask me, this, the funny part about this is like, there's an analogy here to nuclear power. When people think of nuclear power, they think of, oh, we're splitting the atom and then we're harnessing that energy and then we're putting that energy on the grid. But that's not what we're doing in nuclear power. Nuclear power, we're just boiling water, making steam and spinning a turbine. In my head, when I think of quantum computers, I think of these computers that are harnessing the ether. But that's not what's really happening in quantum computers. In quantum computers, we're like stimulating these uh, these entangled qubits and, and we're measuring them. When I think of quantum computers, what I really think of is what these guys are doing. These guys are doing the thing that I would think of as quantum computing, which is like just measuring the random fluctuations in the ether. That's what I would think of as quantum computing. Measuring the ether, Chad. Guys, we are out here. We're just... This is, you know what? We're just coming up. These guys should just hire me to be their marketing guy. I'll just come up with dope ass phrases. Call. We should just, these things, these guys should be saying that they're measuring the ether. Twitter about it, because uh, I want to kind of spread the message. But really, you know, at the large scale, things are classical, they're deterministic. You have, you know, Newtonian physics, you have like ballistics, uh, or in the, in, in the cases you have very strong signals, your computer is in a deterministic state. If you go to very low power and very low temperatures or very small time scales, things are quantum. They're in superpositions. Uh, you know, there's sort of, uh, quantum interference happening, uh, and you can make all sorts of analog quantum experiments, or you could build a quantum computer out of that type of physics. But if you have a, a mesoscale computer, so or a mesoscale system, basically it's jittering, right? So it's, it's more like chemistry or molecular dynamics or the physics of gases sloshing around, and, and it's essentially stochastic. So there's some randomness to the dynamics, and there's some randomness to the state at all times. And so basically, there's an opportunity to build a computer that operates in this mesoscale right? Um, a computer that has a probabilistic state um, that has programmable probabilistic transitions and that uses stochastic thermodynamics. And that's what, we're, that's what we're pioneering. And we think it's the future of silicon. And we also think it's the future of AI hardware from first principles. And why is that? We think, we think deep learning is going to struggle to capture the complexity of nature. Uh, a single forward pass is to get deeper and deeper in order to have enough computational complexity to, to replicate um, uh, you know, the, the, the distribution of the data set. And the distribution of the data set um, sorry, uh, the distribution of the data set, you know, has a lot of compute from nature in order to generate it. 
And if you have to capture everything in one forward pass, you need to make your model bigger and bigger, and then you're going to have more parameters. And then since you have more parameters, you need to kill their entropy, their entropy and you need more data. And so instead, if we basically uh, use, use, um, use sampling, right, use like test time compute scaling, right, as we're familiar, then you can have a higher complexity sort of transformation from your input to your output, and you can capture higher complexity and data and deeper into the tails of the distribution. Um, the problem is, um, you know, Monte Carlo sampling, so to do MCTS and so on, every, any kind of Monte Carlo algorithm kind of sucks on a classical computer. You need a pseudo random number generator, you have this sort of sequential walk. Okay, I like everything he's talking about here. He's talking about, okay, everything is so straightforward. We're trying to like, you know, input this energy here, trying to measure it back out. He says the word first principles. Guys, when you want to sound smart, use the word, just use the phrase first principles as often as possible. Just say, I figured this out from first principles, blah, 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 and then you're going to sound smart as shit. Most people have no idea what it means. Basically, just means they're using standard physics. We're, we're basically going back to the framework of physics to solve a problem, pretty much. So what he's about to explain here, though, is that Monte Carlo is a system we use to derive randomness. So if you've ever done any kind of gambling, let's say, I hate even using this as an example, but if you do gambling online, well, how do you determine what, what you get back in response? It's a Monte Carlo system that uses a, a false random generator, right? And what he's going to say here is it's extremely inefficient. Yes, RNG, RNG, thank you very much. RNG, random number generator. If you don't know what RNG stands for, get it into your lexicon. And what he's saying is the old systems do RNG very slowly. They do it very slowly and inefficiently. And he's saying if we just measure the ether, we measure these thermal fluctuations, then we can get better randomness than the Monte Carlo simulation would get much more efficiently as well. You know, the ratios are right. And then you get um, basically a Boltzmann distribution. And that's really fucking slow. Uh, you could try to paralyze it, but there's a limit, right? So basically to run these algorithms and make them competitive in the algorithmic landscape, you need a new type of computer. And that's essentially what we're building. Right, so our mission is to build the densest substrate for AI. With the, the philosophy stuff, I talk about increasing the wattage of civilization with EAC, and then with extropic, we're trying to gain more intelligence per watt. And then put together, we have more intelligence for civilization. We're scaling uh, essentially the scope and scale of intelligence in our universe. And so, uh, you know, Trevor and I uh, basically hacked like 10 years ago as students at Waterloo how to do AI on quantum computers uh, from first principles, and then Google like pushed us out of. Yeah, I was gonna say, did they just miss? They missed that bleep. <laughs> I feel like that bleep just totally missed that guy's F-bomb, but that's okay. So right here, he's about to explain that basically he's a genius and Google like pulled him out of school because of how much of a genius he is on quantum computers. And then they worked on quantum computers and then they left quantum computers. But let me go back to what he was saying a second ago, because he says that this is basically a probabilistic AI. So when I, again, when I think of probabilistic AI, I'm thinking you're just, me you're taking a cube of data and you're measuring it. You're measuring the randomness in this cube of data or whatever of data. Seems like measuring the medium. And he says, we're doing this because it's instead of stimulating, we're not stimulating this. So the difference between the qubit is we would stimulate these qubits, measure data. In this case, we're not stimulating it. We're using the random fluctuations as a resource. We're using the random fluctuations themselves as a resource. To me, all of this screams zero point energy personally okay. school and then we, we we launched this product known as TensorFlow Quantum and then he went to the hardware division uh, I ended up working for Sergey Brin on like special projects of all kinds in physics and AI but uh, over time we kind of got jaded with quantum and, and we, we, we thought this sort of middle ground was uh, between classical and quantum you know the mesoscales was going to be way more interesting and so we set out to do a bio-inspired or thermodynamic form of computing and so you know we're building hardware we're building compiler, compilers and middleware and we're, we're building ways to connect it to the current deep learning stack uh, so that it just feels like, you know, regular jacks and whatnot. What sort of primitives are you using on this computer? Well, okay, so this gets pretty cool, guys, because this is where he actually explains what it does. You could, you could force, like, imagine we're molding something or we're creating, uh, we're doing sculpting. We're doing sculpting and we're going to sculpt our shape. Our shape is our design. Our shape is our information. So we're going to create this shape of information. And what he's saying is instead of manually creating our shape using this bunch of energy to create the star that we want, instead, we're just going to kind of stimulate, we're going to fluctuate, we're going to force the data into a mold that we want it to be into. 
So instead of actually just physically molding it the way we want, we just put the mold around it and let it form itself into its certain shape. And then we just measure the shape. We measure the shape and that becomes our resource. So if that sounds weird, well, that's because all this competing stuff is pretty damn weird, but maybe I didn't get it right. Let's see. Our, our primitive choices like EBMs or energy-based models, right, which are programmable Boltzmann distributions, those are, they're pretty clean because, um, you know, you parameterize this energy landscape. So essentially we create this potential in which the, the electrons dance. And by just waiting, having this parameterized landscape, so we have a parametric shape, by just waiting, eventually, you know, the red dots can represent electrons in this landscape that's, you know, we controlled with voltages, eventually it equilibrates and gives you a distribution. And then because it's an exponential, uh, you, can actually, you can actually get all sorts of nice learning rules uh, that don't necessarily require backprop. Uh, such as contrast, contrastive learning rules, and, and there's all sorts of learning rules like this, right? It's similar to um, it's similar to like um, Jeffrey Hinton's forward forward algorithm, and so you could train this machine to do machine learning by contrastive learning, uh, and 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 we've done that with uh, some small devices and some bigger ones, um, and uh, essentially, you know, neural nets came from energy-based models. They came from you know looking at averages of layers of of Boltzmann machines, right? That's what the 2024 Nobel Prize was for, and that's when deep learning really started, uh, and so we're kind of going back. We're, we're returned, you know, we're going back to where neural nets came from and just and do, doing these primitives in hardware and software. Um, you know, in terms of applications, I don't have to explain what probabilistic inference can do. It can do most things. It's a superset of, of deep learning. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of cool early, early day applications. And, um, you know, a year and a half ago, we like posted our first experiment online. Uh, we got cooked pretty hard. It was good. Uh, but really for us, it was like, okay, can we, can we even like create a programmable electron diffusion device? And, and show we can run like basic algorithms on it and how the hell would we program it. And basically our learnings from taking quantum computing tech, running it basically hundred times hotter, a lot of, this was like a breadboard prototype. So, you know, we rented this lab in Canada, everything was rented uh, and, 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 and we did some first experiments and now we're, we're kind of sitting on the paper and we're gonna put it out basically after we launch our, our, our first silicon product. Uh, but, you know, the goal there is to like open source uh, a viable way to build this type of computing, uh, you know, that's maybe less commercially interesting but that academia can take and, and, and run with. But, you know, here's our first, our first. Uh... Okay. So yeah, one person said a good comment in the chat is that what is the benefit of this is that the big benefit, probably the number of that. I mean, we already talked about the energy savings, but the, the thing about the energy savings that makes it so significant is that this could be something that could be run in your phone. This becomes now a microchip that can go in your phone where your phone can do AI generative content. So now you don't need to go to a website to log in the chat GP3, chat GP3, whatever, to have it generate content for you. Now your, your computer at home can do it. Why? Because it's a room temperature, it's just a microchip that's being run at room temperature, as opposed to something that needs to be frozen at absolute zero with liquid nitrogen or whatever else they do for superconductivity to happen. This is why room temperature superconductivity is so important. 